Genesis chapter 14, the theme this evening is a war of faith, a war of faith. Now, you might have a question concerning wars. I know it is the Jehovah Witnesses that say that they will not fight in a war because they don't believe in killing another human being. And yet we see here in the scriptures in the Old Testament, Abraham standing up and he will literally fight against these kings to reunite his family. And so war is, I believe, essential at times in the right context. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is a war of faith, because it does take faith to fight a war, especially when you're fighting a righteous war, not an unrighteous war, not a selfish war, nor a um, lustful war for worldly things or for power or for other reasons. This war is for family, to protect the institution of family. And so Lot may not have considered the rocky hills as productive when he dwelt with his uncle uh, Abraham in the valley there. But as he looked at Sodom, which was very green, realizing now that three kings who, or these kings here who come in and raid, who do not consider rocky mountains, but look to green valleys to come in, especially with wealth, to take it over. You would probably recognize that Lot would have chosen something totally different than the choice that he chose at this moment. And he realizes that Abram had a greater and wiser choice. So this chapter presents Abram in an unexpected character of a warrior and also an unlikely father. And so in this chapter, we will see four kings against Sodom that come and take it. Abraham will rescue Lot. Melchizedek will bless Abraham in his return. And then the spoils will be returned. So let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 12 to get the context of this first section here of chapter 14, 1 through 12. And it came to pass in the days of... I'm going to have some problems with some of these names, and I know you probably are too, so you probably won't get it. So... Amraphel, king of Shinar, Erach, king of Elisar, and then Chesdorlomar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Berea, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shibnab, king of Ammonid, and then Shimber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, all of these joined together in the valley of Siddam, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served uh, Cherodolomar, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chelemanar and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rimphams in Ashrath Kirim, the Zuzrim in Ham, and Imin in Shira Kedirshim and the Horites in their mountains of Seir, and as far as El Perim, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to in Misfat, uh, that is Kedish, and attacked all the countries of the Melechites, and also the Amorites, and dwelt in Hezeron, Tamar, and the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Emil, and the king of Zerim, and the king of Bela, that is Zorah, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddam against Shadimalar, king of Elma, Tidal, king of nations, Ephra, king of Sarn, and Erech, king of Elisar, four kings against five. And now the valley of Siddam was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. Uh, the sea, or the sea there, the Dead Sea, uh, is the salt sea that it's speaking of there in southern uh, Israel. It is fed in by the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea does not drain out anywhere, and so it pretty much keeps all the, the garbage there, and that's why they call it the Dead Sea to this day, and nothing grows in it at all. Uh, 
Uh, this was the first war mentioned in the Bible between kings. Now we know there were wars before that because during the time of Noah you had the wicked world coming up against Noah. But in this case, these are kings who are battling each other and of course they're battling for power. Power is always the issue when it comes to battling. You will find two basic kingdoms in the world. One kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. And in Jesus' kingdom, he gives us uh, the most greatest example of all of how we are to be in that kingdom. First of all, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is the king of that kingdom. And when he came to this earth, he came to serve, not to be served, he said, and to be a ransom for many. And so in his kingdom, uh, the best thing to do in his kingdom is to be a servant, uh, not to strive because in his kingdom we've already won. We're already sitting in the heavenly places. We already have an eternal home. And one day God's going to come and take us home. So we're already there. Our home is set. We have eternal life. It's already done. So we're not striving for anything really. What we're striving for is to be faithful. To be faithful to the Lord and what he has called us to do. That's basically it. Just be faithful where God has you. Be faithful to what you Profess with your mouth, be faithful to the Lord, and you serve in his kingdom. Then there's the other kingdom. And in this other kingdom, it's the kingdom of this world. And the God of this world is in that kingdom. And within that kingdom are many kingdoms. And that kingdom is all about power. That's where all the wars start. That's where all the nations battle each other. Because it's all about power, control. Who's going to lead? Uh, even in our country today, there's a battle over who will lead our country. And, and where are they going to lead it to? Uh, Sanders is saying that uh, he's going to give everybody everything that they want and of course someone's got to pay for it and he doesn't care that it's you that pays for it as long as he's the ruler as long as he's the one getting the royalties for it all along with Hillary Clinton you know along with Donald Trump we really don't have anyone up there in office at this moment Cruz stepped out and so we pretty much are in big trouble this coming election but it's all about power and who's controlling this nation who's controlling the wealth who's controlling the direction of this nation within within the nation itself within the states itself all about power who's governor who's mayor who's who's in the city councils and what are they going to do and how much they're going to get paid and and we just recently saw several years ago in in uh, Compton and how this individual who was one of the leaders there was taking money like crazy because it's all about power even within the churches, the struggles within the churches is about power. And so you'll find that's usually what causes the battles. And so these kings are about power and maintaining their power and controlling their power. And so they come down, four kings, uh, and on five kings, and the battle is victorious with the four kings. So for a total of 12 years, and interesting that the number 12 is the number of government, for 12 years, these kings ruled over Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were paying taxes to these kings because they had the power. Uh, the four eastern kings of Mesopotamia had ruled the people of the plains by collecting their taxes. And in the 13th year is when Sodom and these kings rebelled against the high taxation. Now that's going to happen. I think that's going to happen with our country. And by the way, this is talking about politics, isn't it? This is all politics right here. This is exactly what's going on. And, and there are churches out there who are saying that, well, we're not to get involved in politics. Well, Abraham was involved in politics in the very beginning. But he was involved in a very interesting way. And I think that this is prophetic for us here tonight. Unfortunately, we will be the only ones that hear this because I think our world is headed in that direction where kings are trying to take power and capture the USA and tax the USA. I don't know if you remember this, but a, a while ago when they were raising tax, I think it was during the Bush uh, era, uh, they were talking about a flat tax. You remember the flat tax thing? And they wanted to give a flat tax. The people were flat tax. And they said, let's do 10%. Let's just get it over with 10% flat tax. And we're done with it. Let's pay the debt off because they figured and calculated that we'd be able to do all of that. Do you know where the tax rate is today? 8%. I think they they heard that from the people. Wow, they can afford 10%. Okay, let's start increasing it until we get there. And that's exactly what's going on. But at that point, I think there's going to be rebellion because uh, we're, we're paying almost 45% in taxes. Half of our money goes to taxes. We only get to keep half of that. And there's a point where the people are going to rebel against that. And unfortunately, the Democratic parties have lied 
uh, to the Hispanic people, to the poor people, and um, they think that getting things for free is so much better than working for them. And, and that's just where we're at. 12 years, 13 years, they rebelled. Uh, 13, by the way, is the number for rebellion. And it's also the number for Satan. Isn't that interesting? Uh, for usually... Friday the 13th is a very scary day for a lot of people because it's uh, almost uh, satanic in the sense. And so we have here on the 13th year this rebellion that takes place. And then the 14th year, this king and the kings that were with him came and attacked in their mountains of Seir by the wilderness. And the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt and as they were attacking, some of the people fell in the asphalt and died. And the rest of them took their goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their provisions and also lot with them to the mountain range. There were wars then and there will be wars today and the reason that there were wars is because of power. Just wanting to control. In 1 Kings 5.3 it says, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the war which were fought against him on every side until the Lord puts his foes under his soles of his feet. Because of wars. And wars and control of power keeps the work of the Lord at a bay in a sense. And until we can, the church, stand up and change those three things, our power through voting and changing the world and by supporting the churches and by being obedient to the word of God, things are going to continue to go backwards. James says, where do wars and fights come from among, among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? Again, it's power. It's pleasure. It's what you want. Um, I find it interesting. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but it's just interesting how we have uh, several of these candidates um, besides Cruz and Rubio, who Rubio stepped out, I was I was probably going to vote for Rubio or Cruz. And in fact, Virginia and I just met Rubio's father, who is a pastor and preaches the gospel message. And he did a great job on our foundation as a nation. And he was talking about his son, that he's not um, going to stop, but this is just the beginning. He's going to probably run again in four years. But this guy is a born-again believer, and you can see that in his father, and his father raised his son. And so I was probably going to vote for him, but because he stepped out. <clears throat> and so what do we have left? What we have left is what the people want. And what do the people want? They want free things. They want government to control their lives. Uh, they don't want to use their brains. They don't want to use their, their hands to work. They want someone to just feed them. And so they're going to vote for Bernie Sanders. They're going to vote for Hillary. They're going to vote for Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump is a very, very cunning guy. He knows how to manipulate people with his words. And so he is feeding a lot of this stuff to the people to make the conservatives and the Christians think that he's their guy. And I was just sharing with someone today, unfortunately, um, there are Christians who will vote, you know, the lesser of the evils. But as far as I'm concerned personally, it's like if the person's immoral, they're immoral no matter what. They don't know the Lord, so uh, my vote is not going to go for any of them. If, if anything, I will try to find someone. If you look at your ballot, there's uh, all kinds of other parties and individuals listed there. And you can look at all of those individuals and there might be a person there that is a born-again believer that just nobody knows about. I mean, there's the Libertarian Party, the Freedom Party. I, I think I listed like uh, six or seven different parties with all these names that you never even heard of. And so I will look for one and I'll probably vote for that person. But wait a minute. Then Trump may not win. Who cares? The Sanders may win. Who cares? But Hillary might win. Yeah, that's exactly what this nation has been asking for. It's exactly what this nation has been asking for. And I'm telling you, along with many other conservatives and politicians that are Christians and born-again believers, that our country is headed for a great disaster. And if Christians don't stand up now, if they don't stand up for righteousness, if they don't stand up for what is morally right, then we're in big trouble. The enemy has been tearing down our nation. <clears throat> there are three institutions that got established. The first institution is what? Marriage. He established marriage. And what has the world been doing? 
destroying marriage because now marriage is not about a man and a woman having children. I was just watching some program. I was skipping through the channels trying to find news and there's this program. I don't even know the name of it and they're, they're showing wedding cakes and three wedding cakes. The first wedding cake and they were talking about how great the wedding cake is and they said, oh, by the way, did you notice? It's two men on the top of the cake.
union. It also represents Jesus, who is the bread of life, and it also represents wine, his blood. Giving special honor to God, the Most High, who was really responsible for delivering Abram and Lot from their enemies there. And God is always the one to give us the victory. We have to trust in him. Abram then has communion with Melchizedek, king of Salem. Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem. The location of Salem, that town, really isn't clear and, and precise, but we do get a reference in Psalms chapter uh, 76, verse 2, where it says, in Salem, and then it, sa- it clarifies it saying, that is Jerusalem. So it's interesting that Melchizedek comes from Jerusalem. Psalm 76, verse 2. Um, here are some places where Melchizedek is mentioned in the Bible. Psalms 110 verse 4, the Messiah is described as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is called a priest. Jesus is described as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So either Melchizedek is the first priest and Jesus is like him or Jesus is him. And in Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7, and that's a good read. I'm not going to read it, but those chapters are a good read to understand this chapter, so I encourage you to read those later on. But we see where these two passages of the Old Testament are quoted. And the typical relations of Melchizedek to our Lord are stated at great length in those three chapters. The similarities between Christ and Melchizedek uh, consist of the following particulars. Each was a priest before the Levitical tribe. He was superior to Abraham, You remember uh, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, signifying that he was before Abraham. Um, We'll see this in a minute. He was one who had no beginning and no end. He is not only a priest, but also a king of righteousness, as we saw, and peace. And there are those two opinions of who Melchizedek is. He either is a type of Christ, and what I mean by a type of Christ is that his life kind of displays Christ like Joseph. You you remember the story of Joseph? It kind of relates to Christ. You know, Joseph had brothers. Uh, Jesus had a nation Israel that he considered brothers. Uh, Joseph's brothers um, sell him into slavery. You know, Israel sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know, Joseph is thrown into, uh, you know, a a dungeon in a sense. Jesus is, is buried in in a sense you know so we see a lot of similarities there and then later on joseph saves all of israel you know for such uh, that god had worked it all out for that good what they meant for evil god turned around for good and of course jesus saves all of israel through his death on the cross so that's a, a, a similarity in a type so melchizedek could be a type of the messiah jesus or literally the savior himself as i said earlier john eight fifty six, where jesus said to us very clearly before abraham was i am so jesus tells us that there was a time before his birth on this earth where he could appear in history that burning bush i am that was jesus christ the messiah there's another place where joshua runs into the commander of the army of the most high god Many believe that is Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate. And by the way, he's a, he's a warrior, a commander of the army of God, ready for battle. Hebrews 7.3 says, says that Melchizedek is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning or end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now that is so interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> no beginning, no end. Jesus has no beginning, no end. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So it might be a Christophany, they call it, or um, as I said earlier, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who appeared in that form. Now, does it matter which one it is? Not really to us. It's not a doctrinal issue. It's not going to weigh on your salvation, but those things are interesting to a lot of people. Who is this guy? And it's just interesting that, that it relates. For me, what it does, it tells me that the Bible is truly the Word of God. And that from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, it's one book, and God makes it very clear how it just all flows together, works together, and we can truly depend upon it. So, 
though not widely accepted, <clears throat> there's enough credibility here, I think, uh, that we should consider uh, it being Jesus, um, it pre-incarnate. <clears throat> as Melchizedek's name is, means righteousness as Jesus is, is righteous. Um, and so Abraham does something here interesting too that kind of kind of leads that way too all of a sudden he takes everything he has and he gives a tenth of it to Melchizedek the priest obviously and I think later on down the road you'll see in Leviticus that the people are to give the tenth to who? the priest and today when we give our tenth who do we give it to? the church? well we give it to the priest we give it to Jesus we don't give to a place or to a person we give it to Jesus because it's Jesus' money not ours Melchizedek uh, came to bless God for the victory that Abraham had had won in the name of God. Melchizedek seems to have been serving the same God as Abraham. Uh, just another aspect of it. And then Abraham, the patriarch, pays his tithe to him in appreciation for the blessings uh, that he brings to Abraham. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4, it says <clears throat> that it was a tenth of the plunder. Uh, probably an offering or a thanksgiving offering for the victory that God had given him. So he gave a tenth of everything that he had plundered. So, so here in the scriptures though, in Genesis 14, it says he tithed of all. So it could be that everything that he had, he tithed uh, a tenth to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> again, it's interesting that this is the first place that the word tithe is used too. Genesis is a book of beginnings, so if you want to find the true meaning uh, of a doctrine, you know, or a principle, find the first place that it's mentioned in. And it's very clear here that Abraham gave it from his heart, he gave it to the Lord, and he gave a tenth to the Lord before the law was in place, before the New Testament time. And here's the father of all the Jewish nation who is the leader and the example of the people giving a tithe to the Most High God. So I think it's fitting that it's right here in, the, in Genesis, the book of beginnings and the beginnings of tithing <clears throat> and the beginning of a glorious way of giving to the Lord. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions. And you'll see this throughout all of the scriptures. You will see tithing being used. I think it's used over 27 times uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, tithe or tithes and it means a tenth part of what God has given to you uh, Genesis 14 was the beginning of it uh, Le Leviticus 27 31 says if a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithe he shall add one fifth to it so if you didn't want to tithe then in the under the law you could not tithe but you would have to then add interest of one fifth to that when you did have the resources to tithe uh, the law required a tithe. Uh, Malachi 3.8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, he said. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithe and offerings. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Try me and know in this, says the Lord. This is the only place where the Lord says, Try me. And by the way, he's speaking to the priest here. Uh, Abram gave it to the priest, Melchizedek. When you go to the temple, you give it to the priest. The priests were to live off of it. Here, Malachi is reminding the priest that you are to give that tithe to the Lord, and they weren't. Talking about the pastors and the shepherds, not the people. And so here, the pastors and the shepherds, they're supposed to be giving. And God's saying, you're robbing me, and you're not being a good example at it. So the Bible's clear that even the priests are to tithe. Uh, that's why I tithe, because it's biblical bring it into the storehouse. And this is the only place too in Malachi where he says, I'll bless you. And I've experienced that in my tithing, God has always provided for us. Um, I've suggested to those, again, and I always do, <clears throat> if you can't tithe, you need to be giving something and working your way up to tithe. When I first heard about this, again, uh, my life just 180 degree turn, I was so excited, so I just started tithing immediately. And then all my resources pretty much were drained because I wasn't used to tithing. Never heard of tithing before in my life. I was a Catholic. You go to church, you throw a quarter in the in the red little bag. That's what you do, you know. Uh, not, you know, 
$300 or $400 a month, you know, you throw a quarter and then all of a sudden, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month and you're going, wow, that's a car payment. At that time, that's a house payment. You know, that's a lot of money for a lot of people. And so I had to literally step back and start at a lower percent. And then I told the Lord, Lord, I, you know my heart. I want to be like Abraham and I want to tithe to you. So you increase our household and I'm going to, you know, work my way up and that's what I have done and so now we we even give more uh, than than the tenth because the Lord has been so good to us in doing so he promises that and this promise by the way is to priest so it's, it's for me not you <laughs> you don't get an increase no I'm kidding I, I think it's a principle that, that God says when you do give you can't out give God and I think that's the principle it's a New Testament principle too Tithe is, is actually mentioned in the New Testament. People say, no, tithe isn't mentioned in the New Testament. Really? Luke eighteen twelve. I fast twice a week. I give tithe of all that I possess. This is what uh, the rich man said concerning heaven itself. Hebrews 7, 5. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, these are the priests who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren through though they have come from the loins of Abraham but he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithe from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises he's talking about Melchizedek there and again he didn't mention so it's interesting he didn't really mention who he was there then you go to verse 8 it says here mortal men receive tithes but there he received them Interesting, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who received tithes, speaking of Levi, one of Jacob's sons, he received tithe, had to pay tithes through Abraham, so to speak, he says. So even Levi had to pay tithes. And of course, Paul talks about uh, giving with a joyful heart in Second Corinthians chapter 9. Give hilariously, actually, is what the word means there. So when we give, we give to the Lord with joy in our hearts because it's an honor to give to Him and no other reason. And again, that's one of the three things that I told you is, is the most difficult things for Christians to do. Most Christians don't tithe. Most Christians don't vote. Yeah. Uh, most Christians don't pray the way that they sh should and don't live according to the word. So let's finish up. In verse 21 through 24. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from, the, from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, least you should say I have made Abraham rich." Wow, what a man of principle. What a man of principle. Sodom comes along and says, hey, thank you so much. Man, you, you can have the goods for yourself. He just wants the people. Be my people. But you can have all of that stuff. And Abraham says, no, no, no. You don't understand. I serve God. God is my provider. You're not my provider. And nor can you say you're my provider. You know, there's a, there comes a time when you have to say no to people that are providing. Uh, that's happened in this church many a times. I remember a story that Chuck uh, shares where he needed a uh, million dollars to buy a building and this individual came to him and, and said, Chuck, I have a million dollars for you. I want to give it to you. And Chuck told him, no, I don't want it. I want the Lord to do it. And so the Lord provided for him. Us here, when we bought this building, the, the there was an individual that said, go to Pastor Chuck and, and tell him the story. And so we did. And Chuck said, we'll provide the money for the building. We'll take care of it. You just will pay us. I mean, he was going to do the whole thing. And the Lord says, no, I want to show you that I will do it. And so he did it a whole different way that we didn't even think of. And he provided for this building. And so now we own this building. And I love it when the Lord does that. But we have to be willing to see and really pray about it whether we should take it or not from an individual. There are a lot of individuals who will promise a lot of things but for the wrong reasons. And so we have to be careful. And Abraham was not going to take a sandal strap from this guy. Nah, nah. At least you go back. Oh, look at Abraham. I made him rich. Well, that's why they're there. You know, we need to be careful. That's why we don't want government in the church. 
We have to be very careful we don't have government in the church. We do have that nonprofit status, but they can take it any time. That has been established by our founding fathers because of separation of church and state, because of the, um, the, the Derberry letter that was written about the separation of church and state, because it was important that we keep Christianity um, pure from government. And they take that letter and twist it around and say, oh, no, 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 we keep government pure from Christianity. And they tell you that's a constitution, but it's not. It's a letter that was written. We need to understand those things. And so he says, nope, not a sandal strap. I won't take anything except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. Uh, Abner, Eshtal, Mir, let them take their portion and so he said just provide for the food that they they had and the guys that were with me and that's it i don't want anything from you at all let me close with three things that i think are important here one make wise decisions don't put yourself in danger like lot just because it looks greener on the other side don't go for it really pray about it before you do something like that it might look like it's good it might feel like it's good but it may not be good we need to pray and lot realize that he made a bad decision he could have changed it though and he didn't he didn't learn his lesson because he stayed there even after and then god had to send angels to pull him out of there god is faithful if you are going to fight stand up and fight against secularism don't fight with the church stop that it's a waste of time. There's things to be done, a work to do we need to get busy with. We got to reach these people with the gospel message. We got to change the secular world and bring it back under a Christianity flag. So if you're going to fight, stand up for the, the righteous fighting. And then last, um, I think the Lord is asking, give God his tenth. Give God his tenth. And if it's not a tenth, then give him his percent and work your way up and have a heart to give joyfully.